start whenever. Just let me know. Well, why don't you go ahead so we can make sure everybody has, has their time. Great. Uh, so my name is Dr. Michael Amlung. I'm joining you today from the University of Kansas. Um, and this was data that was collected at a collaborator's institution at the University of Georgia. So I want to make sure that they get the credit they deserve. And we ran a project where we were looking at predictors of smoking cessation outcomes uh, using delayed reward discounting and its neural correlates as predictors. So this is the overall poster. You can download it, I believe. Um, but I'll highlight the key points here. So first of all, in terms of the background, we know that delayed reward discounting or essentially preferences for smaller immediate versus larger delayed rewards is a behavioral economic index of impulsivity. And steeper delay discounting is consistently associated with smoking relapse. And uh, I saw Dr. Yoon here on the call and some of his work as well in uh, postpartum smoking women um, showed this as well. But we did a recent systematic review where we consistently showed that steeper delay discounting predicts smoking cessation outcomes. And if you take it into neuroimaging context, we've begun to characterize the neural correlates of delay discounting in a range of samples. But where we have not gone is to predicting smoking related outcomes or other treatment outcomes. So here we're using functional MRI as a tool to predict behavioral and neural correlates of smoking relapse in adult smokers following a nine week smoking cessation protocol. In terms of the methods, uh, we enrolled 41 smokers. They were predominantly male, as you can see here, only 32% female, around 40 years old, smoked around a pack a day, FTND was around five, so you know, moderately nicotine dependent, but not certainly not uh, heavily nicotine dependent. But they were motivated to quit on a readiness ruler of at least five or greater on a scale of one to 10. Uh, they did a monetary delay discounting paradigm in the scanner, which I'll show you a, a screen cap of that in a minute. And then we coded their choices based on difficulty, and I'll explain that in a minute as well. Underwent a one and a half hour fMRI scan, as well as a free nine week smoking cessation protocol in the psychology clinic at the University of Georgia, where they received free nicotine replacement therapy and with weekly group counseling sessions. And smoking relapse was operationalized as smoking one cigarette a day per week, expired CO of 10 parts per million or dropping out of the trial. This was a schematic of what the behavioral economic delay discounting tasks looked like. So they were asked questions like, would you rather have $70 today or in a week for the delay discounting trials? We also had control trials where both options were available immediately. And this allowed us to control for things like at least reading the stimuli, making simple choices, motor responses, we could control for that by using this text. And then they had a, a inter-stimulus interval of just X's on the screen. If you imagine a, a given delay, they may receive these assortment of choices anywhere from $10 immediately up to $99 immediately. And this is an example of a choice pattern for a one week delay. One means I choose the immediate, two means I choose the delayed. And normally we would traditionally identify a point of indifference where their preferences are gonna change. And then what we do based on that is we code choices based on choice difficulty. So choices proximal to their point of indifference so the point of indifference plus or minus one choice is coded as hard choices, whereas the others are considered easy choices. And this has been implemented in a number of previous discounting studies. In terms of the results, we found that after treatment, after the nine week protocol, 23 of the participants resumed smoking and 18 of them did not. So not quite a 50-50 split, but uh, about 23 of the people resumed smoking. In terms of the behavioral response, we found the characteristic pattern that we were expecting so here we're showing uh, points of indifference, the individual data points at, a, at delays across the x-axis and the discounted value of a $100 reward. So the steepness of this curve, the extent to which it, it uh, drives down faster is an indication of steeper discounting or more impulsive choice. In this case, we're showing area under the curve. So smaller area under the curve indicates steeper discounting. And there was a significant difference between our individuals that ended up in the relapse group versus the ones that were able to maintain uh, smoking abstinence over the course of the nine week trial. In terms of the imaging results, this is just the maps for the two different trial types. So what you can first appreciate is that there was substantially greater activation during those hard choices right at the indifference point relative to the easy choices in a variety of areas, including dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, bilateral medial and middle frontal gyrus, as well as anterior insula and some subcortical regions such as caudate and putamen, but also posterior parietal cortex back there in the precuneus on the third image. 
When we looked at differences between the relapse group and the no relapse group, we did not find any main effects. So there were no regions that the relapse group uniformly had significantly greater or significantly less activation relative to the no relapse group, but we did see group by choice interactions in four regions. And I think one of these is the most interesting. So if you look at the precuneus on the right, the third set of graphs, the uh, solid bars are the relapse group and the checkered bars are the no relapse group. What we see is in the no relapse group during those hard choices, there's a clear increase in activation during the hard choices in this posterior parietal cortex region that's not observed in the relapse group. In fact, the relapse group had slightly higher response during the easy choices or the ones that were farther away from the indifference point. Uh, same general pattern, mostly related to reduced activation in the control trials in the relapse group, but no group main effects. So we had a, we had a robust behavioral difference, but we didn't find a very robust uh, neural difference. So just to conclude and wrap up with the time I have left, uh, these results, we believe, further characterize the neural correlates of delayed discounting in smokers. To our knowledge, it's only the second study to do so. Um, and those that discounted more steeply in their behavioral data were more likely to resume smoking following treatment. And even though we didn't have statistical power to do a lot of complex uh, modeling, because we only had 41 participants, we did see a few interaction effects that at least give us some clues that we need to run a much larger study that's more uh, uh, more well-powered for this. So that's where we're going uh, in the future. With this work, I do want to acknowledge the collaborators, especially the people that funded this work, so NIDA and NIAAA for funding our time, as well as these two addiction centers. And you can email me, and I'm also on Twitter if you have any questions about this work. So thanks for the opportunity to present, and I'll pass on to the next speaker. Good job, uh, Dr. Emlon. Uh, yes. We do have a little bit of time for questions after your uh, presentation. And you guys can also save your questions for a general Q&A with all the presenters at the end. Okay, um, I'll go ahead and stop sharing so the next speaker can pull theirs up. If there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them now. I know. So I remember way back, you know, there were all those studies that showed like, you know, working memory training, right? You yes, know, yes. Areas. So kind of relate, but, you know, we didn't see much later, right? Like we're all waiting for the follow-up, like, oh, you know, yeah. this will improve discounting. Does that actually affect sure. behaviors of interest? Sure. So based on your data, do you think there's targets that we can kind of alter those associated areas in a way that will impact behavior later on, right? Well, I think you're exactly right. You know, a lot of these sort of behavioral interventions or, or cognitive interventions, episodic future thinking, working memory training, executive function training, they, they're associated with kind of small movement of the needle when it comes to delay discounting, right? We might make people a little bit less steep. And then, but what we were lacking was then connecting the dots between that and the actual clinical outcome of abstinence or reductions in smoking. I, I do wonder if there are ways that we can um, possibly augment the brain circuitry, but I will note that one of the areas that those purported interventions are targeting is dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, and that didn't differ. And there was no interaction, there was no significant difference. So for one reason or another, the people that were less likely to maintain abstinence or, or, or uh, resume smoking, they showed that behavioral pattern, but it wasn't linked to a deficit in their sort of frontal cortical areas. Now it could be somewhere else that's some other type of intervention, but you're right. Those are, those tend to be very small effect sizes. And we also don't have a lot of data on the durability of them. So we don't know how long they last. You know, a small effect size shift in your discounting after a single or even a couple uh, bouts of training if it's not durable, then it doesn't have much impact. So I I'm, I'm, think I'm just as skeptical as you are about those, but that's a great question. I think we'll save the rest of the end to make sure that other speakers have a chance. Yep, so next up is our very very own Dr. Tyler Erath. Hey, you're muted at the moment. Yep. I was muted, sorry about that. Again, you'd think after this many, this many months we get it figured out. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, yes, um, my name is Tyler Erath, and so today I'm going to be presenting on a study that um, examined the differences in the relative reinforcing value of cigarette smoking among individuals with cumulative vulnerabilities. To provide just a quick background, populations with co occurring uh, socioeconomic or health related disadvantages are at an increased risk for smoking 
In addition, recent research suggests that the risk of smoking does vary in this orderly and cumulative manner in association with the presence of co-occurring vulnerabilities. With respect to smoking as a behavior, reinforcement is widely recognized to be the process that underpins chronic smoking. So the primary question examined in this study was to see if cumulative vulnerability moderates the effects of reduced nicotine content cigarettes on the relative reinforcing value of smoking. Participants here were 775 adult daily smokers who were participating in a 12-week multi-site trial that evaluated the addiction potential of research cigarettes that varied in nicotine content. So for cumulative vulnerability, there were a total of seven potential vulnerabilities, and participants were categorized as having low, or zero to one, um, moderate, or two to three, or um, high, which was four to five cumulative vulnerabilities. And so these seven vulnerabilities included rural residents, current substance use disorder, current affective disorder, low educational attainment, poverty, unemployment, and physical disability. And all participants completed the cigarette purchase task at four different time points. So at baseline, and then at study weeks two, six, and 12. And this was done to assess the reinforcing efficacy of smoking their assigned study cigarette and then their usual brand cigarette. And then for outcomes, uh, demand was being assessed using two latent factors, so demand amplitude and demand persistence. And depicted here are the results. Um, so the top left portion of the slide contains the models with variables and interactions that were found to be statistically significant. Um, and then the remaining portions of the slide depict the graphs for demand amplitude and persistence for each of the types of cigarettes. Um, starting on the top right for usual brand cigarettes, there was a significant main effect for cumulative vulnerability on demand amplitude in that demand in the moderate and high cumulative vulnerability groups differed significantly from the low group, um, but those two higher groups did not differ from each other. There was also a significant two-way interaction of nicotine dose and time. Um, so no significant differences were observed between doses at the two-week assessment. Then at the six and 12-week assessment, though, there were significant reductions in amplitude for the low nicotine cigarettes when compared to the high nicotine cigarettes. And then for study cigarettes, there was also a significant main effect of cumulative vulnerability on demand amplitude, um, with significantly increasing demand at each level of vulnerability. There was also a significant interaction of nicotine dose and time here again, with amplitude at the 0.4 milligram dose, um, significantly below the 15.8 milligram dose across all the assessments. And we also found demand at the 2.4 milligram nicotine dose below levels at the six and 12 week assessments. For persistence uh, with study cigarettes, there was a significant three-way interaction of cumulative vulnerability, nicotine dose time, with greater reductions at the 0.4 milligram dose compared to the 15.8 milligram dose. And greater demand reductions were also seen in the low cumulative vulnerability group when compared to the moderate and high vulnerability groups. So overall, we found that cumulative vulnerability was positively associated with greater demand for smoking, especially demand amplitude. And um, more broadly, these results suggest that a nicotine standard that reduces the nicotine content in cigarettes to minimally addictive levels would decrease demand amplitude independent of cumulative vulnerability severity, which is um, good to see. Um, it would have more graded impact, though, in reducing demand persistence with the largest reduction seen among those with low levels of cumulative vulnerability. And so to wrap up, um, so of the two latent factors, these results suggest that demand amplitude may be an important clinical target for reducing smoking in vulnerable populations. Some declarations of funding, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions as well. So I had a question about the, um, the relative distribution of these nine vulnerabilities. Would you, would you have enough of a, distribution among them where you could actually look at specific individual vulnerabilities? I mean, I understand you're looking at cumulative, but was it that, you know, one of these vulnerabilities, if you had that one, it was really driving the effect? So that's something that um, within the data we are actually has been um, partially looked at and has been 
finally looked at altogether. But yeah, it would be interesting to see. And that was one of the first questions I had was wondering whether or not there's one or two of these that might be predictors, which would have um, significant implications for understanding how to go about, you know, addressing this, um, these behaviors. Um, interestingly, um, it was nice to see at least the results were orderly in the sense that as you see a greater number of vulnerabilities, you start to see higher amplitude. And um, one of the things that I think is most fascinating to me is persistence when you're getting up into that um, higher vulnerability group. It was pretty strong. I mean, persistence, that group definitely was persisting um, much more so than say the low cumulative vulnerability groups. So they could have different implications uh, at an intervention level, um, for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, that was one of my questions was, uh, so you were you saying that amplitude was where it was not having the same effect or the effect was not different? So amplitude um, was, but it was a little more orderly. Um, and, but then with persistence, we were seeing um, amplitude definitely had a larger of the two of, of the two um, factors. Amplitude definitely had a larger effect size. So all the way from baseline throughout on the assessments, its effect size was almost double compared to um, persistence. But yeah, I was so I was thinking about like the combination of nicotine reduction policy in conjunction with the tax increases and, and where you think you would really see those effects. Yeah, and it, um, to pull back up the, or I won't pull back up the data, but yeah, it would be interesting to see um, because I think one of the key components is if that persistence is staying high with that high cumulative vulnerability group, which is also most more susceptible in many ways as well, um, then it could be um, targeted, so say like taxations or other things, it could have um, different sorts of ramifications if, if persistence is still there irrespective of the amount of nicotine that's in the cigarette and the cost, um, definitely some implications at that level as well. Okay, good stuff. Uh, our, if there's no other questions, we can move on to our next presenter, who's Carolyn Evany. Hello, can you uh, see my screen all right? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I'm Carolyn Evany. I'm a third year PhD candidate and uh, my mentor is Steve Higgins. And my poster is on examining the factor loading pattern of a hypothetical cigarette purchase task, which seems like a pretty good follow-up. <laughs> um, so I, I, this research started with the purchase task itself, um, which I enjoyed using because I look at, uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and I'll use my pointer to direct where I am on the poster for ease. Um, I really like, not only because it's a highly validated measure of cigarette demand, but also because um, you can, conduct a purchase test without having participants come into the, the laboratory and actually consume cigarettes, which is nice for uh, in researchers who study vulnerable populations like pregnant women, which I'm, uh, I'm researching a lot of these days. So uh, the purchase test that we used was adapted from the McKillop et al. 2008 purchase task, um, where we used the five demand uh, in index to calculate demand, uh, which is intensity, Omax, Pmax, breakpoint, and alpha. Uh, the, what they uh, mean all, is all listed there, but I won't harp on that because I think there's a lot of behavioral economic people in here. <laughs> um, but, and I, the measures of demand are great and they can produce a really smooth uh, demand curve. Um, but as you can see in this, uh, in this uh, correlation matrix on the top right, if you, look at them, um, at their relationships between each other, uh, they're a highly correlated set of indices. So in 2012, um, a, another researcher noticed this and decided to conduct a, uh, a dimension reduction technique uh, called a principal component analysis to uh, try to see if we could get a more parsimonious representation of demand um, and to see which of these indices uh, stood out as a significant uh, as a means of determining demand. Um, 
So our population was uh, 665 pregnant women who completed an intake assessment to assess eligibility for their for a smoking cessation trial at at a University of Vermont. And um, if we go through the demographics, um, most of the participants were uh, 30 or older. Um, over two thirds of our participants had less than 12 uh, 12 or less years of education. Um, our one thing to note, our racial ethnic uh, split was not um, up to standard with the re most recent PATH data where we had a more non-Hispanic white uh, sample than uh, what's reported in PATH. Um, another thing to note within smoking history variables, most of our participants indicated that prior to pregnancy, they were smoking over 10 uh, cigarettes per day. Then after learning of their pregnancy uh, about 30% uh, indicated that they were smoking 10 or less cigarettes per day. Uh, same uh, pattern here with the time to first cigarette. Uh, most participants indicated that they were uh, smoking um, greater than five minutes after waking upon learning of their pregnancy, which is about a 20% um, increase from prior to their pregnancy. Um, so when we were in the component analysis, we used a standardized regression coefficient of uh, greater than 0.4 on, on, on any particular index uh, to be included in a factor. Uh, this table three is our mean index scores and the rotated loading pattern matrix for the, uh, for the, from the PCA. Uh, so you can see um, we had a two, a two factor solution, which is similar to all prior studies. Um, where uh, our amplitude uh, factor accounted for 22% of the variance, uh, explained 22% of the variance in the uh, five indices. And we had uh, amplitude, uh, uh, sorry, intensity um, and uh, Omax load on amplitude uh, for our persistence factor, which accounted for 65% of the variance in the five uh, indices. Um, we had a co-load of Omax uh, where it loaded on both factors, uh, the Pmax factor, uh, alpha, or the elasticity across the demand curve, and our breakpoint value loaded on persistence. Um, so important to mention, which probably could have mentioned in the beginning, uh, this is the first time that this uh, uh, component analysis has been run in a, a sample of pregnant women. And consistent with all the prior studies, we did find the two-factor solution, uh, which re referred to as amplitude and persistence. Um, and overall, we could explain 87% of the variance in the CBT index using these um, using these two uh, latent factors, which we we're quite happy with. And that's about all I have. I am sorry if I was a little scattered. I. Uh, I did get married on Saturday, so I've been a little bit um, all over the place. <laughs> well, you did great, and congratulations, by the way. Thank you. Congratulations, Hello. indeed. Thank you. I wasn't going to mention it if it was like a big group, but since it's just eight of us. <laughs> now it's so I was... going to get a gift. <laughs> <laughs> so congratulations on the wedding, first of all, but um, I want to ask about what appears to be like you maybe have some subgroups of pregnant smokers here, right? So you have some smokers for which they reduced their smoking once they learned of their pregnancy and those that did not. Did you think about possibly looking at those as two separate subgroups and maybe the factor structure might be different because one might be you know, either a heavier smoking group or you know, have higher FTMD score or something along those lines? Yeah, I think that that would be a great idea. Uh, I did something somewhat similar to this for my master's thesis where I looked at uh, the subgroups that we used were participants who had indicated that they made at least one quit attempt prior to their pregnancy versus those that did not. And there were uh, significant differences in amplitude and persistence uh, where participants who indicated that they had not uh, made a quit attempt had higher levels of amplitude and persistence or a greater demand arguably, uh, than those who had indicated that they had made at least one quit attempt. And we did use that as a proxy measure too. So now we are uh, moving forward, looking at uh, predicting actual late-term pregnancy abstinence with the, uh, with the purchase task or with the latent factors. And uh, I think that there's, 
I mean, incredible room for uh, data analysis with this approach. And there are tons of subgroups that we could continue to look at probably until whenever we want to stop. <laughs> yeah, I think it's also interesting because you say that the data came from the intake assessment, but that also begs the question of, you know, does this predict outcomes, which I think would be really interesting as well, you know, for those women that were eligible and completed the smoking cessation trial, kind of similar to what we were trying to do with discounting, you know, can you use the demand of disease at baseline to predict who is successful in your smoking cessation trial? So it's really cool work. Congratulations. Thank you. I can follow up when uh, Mike asked. So one, um, I'm aware of the persistence ampl amplitude assessment, although I've never done it. When you uh, do persistence in particular, are you using, does it matter if you use alpha or essential value in the calculations? Um, we did, but I'm not sure that it, it does matter. We okay. followed it based off of prior literature. Like we wanted to make sure that our methods replicated those that we were trying to translate. But I mean, the main reason I'm asking is because um, uh, we did a trial with uh, cocaine users, you know, looking at demand over time, and it was a treatment trial. And sometimes you get people who just choose zero across the board for the purchasing task. Uh, and I know people have dealt with it differently, but uh, Miki Kafernas, he was nice enough to kind of talk me through. And he, I've become a proponent of using essential value because there's now a few papers that use an EV of zero. Uh, and there's some reasons why you might want to do that. Um, that's just, I was just curious that, and especially since you're using a population that probably that at baseline, some of them might say zero or they might over time do that. So it's something to consider. Yeah, that actually, I really appreciate it. I will go and look further into that because we do, since this is uh, our smoking cessation trial is remote. So we do have quite a bit of missing data just from people filling out a huge intake survey on their phones. So that would be really helpful, I think. <laughs> Very good presentation, Carolyn. Thank you. Very good job. Um, so we're going to move on to Eric, uh, Dr. Thrailkill. Right? Yep. <clears throat> I have to remember to unmute before I share my screen. Yes, that stuff happens. Order of operations. That's right. All right, um, <clears throat> so hopefully it's showing up. Um, so this is a, a new area of research that I've just begun as a uh, project director at the Vermont Center on Behavior and Health. My background is in um, preclinical research on uh, basic behavioral processes. Um, but I'm saying that I'm super happy and grateful to be here with this group and to show this new data with you. Um, I'm not an invested behavioral economist, and so it's kind of fun to start to broach these topics um, with people that might be able to help me out with maybe a little bit more experience. Um, so uh, to start off, I just want to thank everybody at VCBH and uh, funding sources um, to me and, and to Steve. <clears throat> and uh, so why are we interested in decision-making biases in health? Well, of course, they seem to contribute to unhealthy behavior. There's lots of research to support that, uh, particularly with delayed discounting. Um, however, behavioral economists have identified quite a few um, biases in judgment and decision-making. And one of the most important ones was loss aversion. I mean, you think back and read these papers on behavioral economics and even the new ones like the new version of Nudge or uh, Thaler's book from a few years ago, they talk about loss aversion or the, the differential impact of losses, losses weighing more than equivalent gains on your decision making um, as, as predating prospect theory. So this is one of the inspirations of prospect theory. And prospect theory was developed to account for this idea of loss aversion and decision-making. And the field of substance abuse, 
loss aversion has been studied as a behavioral economic bias. Um, so individuals who drink alcohol or in treatment for alcohol use are less loss averse than uh, con uh, control group. People who use cocaine are less loss averse than predicted by prospect theory or, or, co or control group. And people use uh, a variety of substances or poly users um, in general are to, have been shown to be less loss averse. Um, and in looking at this research, though, there's there's things that pop out as as as, as could be uh, looked at in better detail. And so, none of these studies actually account for um, <clears throat> other substance use that are strongly associated with alcohol and cocaine use, such as cigarette smoking, and uh, their differences in loss of loss aversion. And none of them account for other important um, behavioral economic factors, um, such as delayed discounting and loss aversion. So it could be the fact that delayed discounting is completely um, accounting for these differences that are being shown in loss aversion. Or it could be that loss aversion is accounting for these differences in delayed discounting that we're seeing. So it's good to look at this in more detail and that's what this study is about. Um, so I wanted to measure loss aversion in a sample of current daily cigarette smokers. I define them as reporting that they smoke more than 10 cigarettes per day. And then compare that to a matched uh, control group of never smokers um, who smoke less than 100 cigarettes in the lifetime. So it's sort of taking the approach of the, the classic um, uh, Madden, Bickle, and Odom, those groups that compared smokers and never smokers, uh, delayed discounting. And I uh, recruited this group of people from Mechanical Turk earlier this year and I uh, used a stratification strategy that I can talk about more if you're interested in um, to uh, match the groups on gender and education uh, attainment. And then we measured loss aversion as well as delayed discounting in, in these people. And we also included measures of other substance use and behavioral health problems, which I'll get into later. But important to talk about first is how the heck do I measure loss aversion? And so I used this task that was um, first published in, in Science. Uh, it's since been published in several other um, venues, and there's been a lot talked about about it. But um, it basically is presenting each participant with a series of uh, hypothetical 50-50 gambles. And this is the actual screenshot of what they were shown. So this is like a coin toss cartoon and they have four different choices. They could uh, strongly, they could reject or uh, <clears throat> they could accept the coin toss. We're just asking them across a number of different amounts offered for the potential loss and potential gain. Uh, from the coin flip. These aren't actually played, they're just, would you flip the coin? Um, so here, say, if the potential win was $60 and the potential loss was $6, well, you, you would. You'd probably say, yes, I'd flip the coin. Um, and the next trial, perhaps, yeah, you could possibly win $32 and lose $16. Here, you might be a little bit more indifferent. You might accept or you might reject it. It, it might be, you might be on the fence here. Um, but here, if, okay, now the win is $32 and the loss is $31, you might be more likely to reject this gamble. It might, be, might not seem as attractive. Um, so what we're actually looking at here with this task is this sort of matrix of potential trials that, or of the trials that they get. They get every single one of these trials. And so here I have on the, on the left, the gains are increasing here and then the losses are increasing down, down here on, on the next. So, so they get every single one of these trials, and so you'd expect them based on prospect theory or ba not based on, based on loss aversion, the empirical evidence of loss aversion of, of losses weighing about twice as much as gains. Um, but the, these green squares would be the, the um, uh, where you'd expect people to accept these trials. And then these yellow squares are where it's 50-50, so 2 to 1, 12 to 6, so on and so forth. You would expect people to be indifferent to these trials. And so if they accept about half the trials in the task, that means that they're loss averse because the gains are twice as large as the losses. And indifference here, accepting half, means that the losses weigh about, as half, by about twice as much as the gain. And now if they accept more, then 
and these these in the red area here where they expect them to reject they some of these squares are have gains that are higher than the, the losses that they're offered so 12 is larger than 11 you know 22 is larger than 21 so the value here of the gain is higher than the loss so you might expect if they're maximizing to accept that if they're going just off the value but loss aversion we expect you'd only accept about half of them so if you expect so if you accept more than half the gains or more than half of the uh, trials here that means behaviorally that you're less loss averse and if you accept more than half it means behaviorally that you're more loss averse and so i'm just sort of saying that in text here um, and so we also gave people the delayed discounting task. Um, this is the 27 hour item monetary choice questionnaire. Um, it really reflects that I don't really, I'm, I don't really care about delayed discounting. It's just a simple task to measure delayed discounting, but I've made sure to present it in a trial based manner in the same way as I presented the, uh, loss aversion task. Okay. So here's a summary of some of the sample characteristics. Uh, we collected about, we tried to collect about 200 people in each group. Uh, we got pretty close and tried to collect similar number of uh, males and females and um, levels of education. Um, we didn't quite achieve that. Um, so we included age, gender, and education in all of the statistics that I'm gonna present. And so I'll just say that off the bat. Um, and here is the, most of the people smoked more than 10 cigarettes per day. Uh, because that was one of the criteria to be in the study. Um, okay, so let's get to the results. And so here's a graph showing the proportion out of all the choices that they had. So they had 49 possible accept or reject decisions. How many of them were uh, accept? And so in this condition that I showed you was two to one gains were twice as large as losses. Um, you see that in the never smokers, they accepted pretty much exactly half of the trials. So this is consistent with what loss aversion is behaviorally. Um, they're indifferent. They're showing us that the loss is valued about twice as much as, as the gain to them. In contrast, smokers accepted more significantly more than half, significantly more gambles than never smoked. So the smokers were less loss averse than the never smokers. Okay, so everybody also received another condition uh, where the gain and loss amounts were reversed in this task. So now the gains are going up to around 31, and the loss is going up to around 62. Um, so we look at the expected, whether they would be expected to accept or reject. Now there's only about maybe 16% uh, that would be expected to accept instead of 50. But you also have these sort of borderline cases as well where you might be generous and uh, maybe, so maybe up to 30% would be consistent with loss of provision. These are more than twice the size of the, uh, but the gain is about twice as large as the loss. But we definitely expect everybody in this condition to reject most of the gambles. And that's exactly what they did. Um, but you can see that smokers still accept more gambles than the never smokers. And the never smokers are within that sort of 16 to 30% acceptance range, which would be consistent, which would be consistent with what would be expected uh, if they were loss averse. And it's just that the smokers are just tending to be more or less loss averse, sorry, across uh, both conditions, okay? And we also collected delayed discounting data. As I said, we get the, the uh, canonical difference between smokers and never smokers replicated here yet again, that smokers are discounting uh, delayed gains um, more steeply than never smokers. Okay. One thing I mentioned is that we also collected uh, substance use and other behavioral problems. Um, we presented people with this task on MTurk. Uh, it was a very vague description. It was we just complete questionnaires, tasks, and then the description was just brief surveys about health. So it was we did this to, to not cue that we were looking for smoking because we don't want people to lie to us and steal all our money. And also we wanted to um, 
be able to know beforehand uh, about these other sorts of uh, problems that people had. So we asked them in addition to, so we presented here uh, all these questions in you know, it's a randomized order. It wasn't presented the same way every time. We asked them about smoking and alcohol, and whether they sleep well, whether they're anxious or depressed, uh, and then how much they use drugs currently. So these are all current use. Um, and this allowed us to, to also dichotomize the sample on alcohol use, other drug use, sleep problems, and uh, depressed mood, and compare loss of aversion uh, between these other substance using groups and their combinations. And so this is a table showing those group effects. Um, so we have substance use and other problems. You have cigarette smoking, alcohol, the drugs, smoking alcohol, smoking drugs, alcohol, drugs, so on and so forth, and mood and sleep disturbance. And you see the, the difference between people that said they that said yes, they did have those problems, and those that didn't uh, was significant in the terms of <clears throat> their loss aversion or gambles accepted. Um, and this is also true, this effect remained significant when controlling for delayed discounting is covariate in the analysis, um, which was nice. And then we also looked at delayed discounting and delayed discounting controlling for loss aversion in the analysis, and delayed discounting remained significant for the most part, the exception of alcohol. So it seems that these, these biases might be independent. Okay, so to summarize, we observed low loss aversion in uh, cigarette smokers and groups to economize other substance use patterns. Um, we did not see that um, on these other behavioral health problems, though, so direct depressed mood or sleep problems, either for discounting or loss aversion. Um, overall, we've seen, we saw the same sort of signal with the uh, delayed discounting as we see we saw with loss aversion. And so we can sort of say from these data, at least from the MTurk sample, that loss aversion is strongly associated with smoking alcohol, other substance use, even when accounting for delayed discount. Um, loss aversion and discounting seem to be independent. And this might suggest that loss aversion should be looked at more intensively as a protective factor and possible intervention target, just like delayed discounting is being currently. Um, however, it needs to be replicated in a larger sample, that sort of thing. We're, much, we're so much further behind delayed discounting, uh, this sort of thing, but it, it could be a, a second bias that could be a very interesting and important. Um, so we're currently trying to, to do this in a, in a larger, more representative sample. So that's the talk. Thank you very much. I can take any questions. Great stuff, Eric. Very good. Sorry, right, we got like one minute left of the session. Does anybody have a question for Eric? I have a question for Eric, but I'm going to email you. <laughs> Feel free to you can always drop by. It was very interesting stuff, and I'm trying to do M third things. So, all right. Very good job to all our presenters. Thank you so much for coming to the VCABH conference, and thank you to everyone who attended uh, the session. We are. And we'll see you all hopefully in sessions tomorrow. Great. Continue to enjoy Thanks the Thanks for conference. organizing. Thanks for organizing. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.